I am Dr. Kate Helson, and it is tempore covidis, as I like to say. Uh, that would be Latin for in the time of COVID. Uh, so I, don't worry, no one is within t two meters of me, um, but I think that I'm, I'm more articulate when I can take my mask off. This is the section where we talk about this manuscript, this antiphoner that we have at Western Archives um, with the sigla of uh, M2150, which is said to be a 16th century um, Spanish antiphoner from Granada, Spain, um, brought to the library here, bought from a Parisian book dealer in the 1960s. Um, the first part of this was the codicological aspects of this book, so the material of it, uh, how it's put together, the kinds of, of um, planning issues and um, physical being in the world, how, how that all was put together. Now, this section is what I'm, um, it, it, it starts in the world of codicology, paleography, and it goes into the world of musicology, uh, especially when we're dealing with old musicology, so historical musicology, we're always flipping between these two worlds, and paleography kind of stands in the middle of them, um, and so I'm going to start with the paleography that has more to do with the musical side of things, uh, and then move from there into the contents of this book, so musically what's here, uh, and also liturgically what's here, because you heard me say this is an antiphoner, that means it is a book for the monastic or um, non-monastic church, and it's full of chant uh, for the Christian church, and uh, in a certain time of year, as we'll find. So the first thing I want to do is talk about paleography a little bit. So before we get into the musical paleography, I want to look at the textual paleography, um, where you can see a little bit of notation at the top, but then we have some larger black script and some smaller um, with, with red and black uh, together, and you can also see the lines that they've scored to make everything nice and even. Um, this, is a, this is an anomalous page. Most of the pages don't have this much text. Most of them are just music. Um, so this particular book, being from the very, very late Middle Ages, uh, some might say Renaissance, except that what, it's, um, what it is in the world is a vehicle for a medieval tradition, which means that even though when we think of 16th century, we think that we are well and truly in the Renaissance, um, this does not have Renaissance music in it. It's got only Gregorian chant. Uh, and secondly, it is made to the standards that developed through the High Middle Ages and then into the Late Middle Ages. And it uses a kind of a script that by the time this book comes along, which is, again, very, very late um, medieval, if you can call it that at all, this, the script called uh, Gothic Textura has it, it, it had its heyday actually earlier than the 16th century, but now in the time that this book was written, um, it symbolizes the tradition of the church. So we're looking at a script, which is this textura form, um, that is hearkening back to the days of um, the, the, the height of, of chant in the, in the church. Even though in the 16th century, you would hear chant, but you would also hear very, very, very elaborate, complex, beautiful polyphony as well. So harmony everywhere. It's not just chant anymore. So the first thing then is this textura look. Um, and the second thing that I want to talk about with that in, in that context is how big this book is. Again, we're not talking about a time when personal books weren't known. Um, the 16th century, you had even um, sold prints, uh, printing of um, musical scores. Now, most of that was either lute tablature or organ keyboard works. Um, not, a, but but singing would would kind of come with that. You'd have the lyrics to the words that were being accompanied by the lute or whatever or on the keyboard. Um, but this massive book is obviously not for one person to sing from. Uh, it would be, again, following this old tradition of the church, you would mount this and you would have this 
and an absolute identical copy of this on the other side of your main aisle of your monastery. And then the people on this side would all be referring to this book, and there would be this other one on the other side, and even the page turns would be exactly the same, so that you would gather around the book and you would all see it. That means that you need this to be fairly big. Um, so this format in the musicological world is called the choir book format. Um, you may have seen images of, of um, especially monks and nuns in the late, um, late Middle Ages and, and, and early Renaissance all gathered around in a kind of a horseshoe around a big manuscript. Um, and they, they sometimes even show Renaissance composers as part of that. Uh, they're either teaching or something from one of these big books, and that's this format. Now, the reason I bring up the size and the formatting of this book, and the fact that it's a group thing, is because I need to talk about this Gothic textura again. One of the things that makes this kind of writing really good for large formatted type stuff is its angularity and the thickness of the quill that's used to make the text. Um, if you look at smaller books, court records, poetry from this time. It's a different kind of writing entirely. It looks way more cursive, it's smaller, um, and you'd never be able to kind of um, blow that up, if you want, <laughs> into a format that would, that would work well for this kind of size. So when you have these angular um, lines and the difference between the, the narrow edge of the quill and then the thick edge of the quill, um, which you'll be able to see when you see um, this, the, the close-ups of how the letters are actually rendered. Um, it makes it very clear from a distance, and that's why Gothic Textura is preferred for choir book format. Now, coming along with that aesthetic of, of the regularity of the bottoms, of the angularity of the lines, comes the musical notation. Um, and this kind of notation here is called square notation or quadratic notation. Um, sometimes people mistake these square notes as neumes. Um, that's a word that gets kicked around a lot in medieval musicology. And if you are somebody who uh, works on medieval notation from another 500 years before this book would have come out, you would see a very different thing called a neum. And so we like to try to keep the word neum to those very, um, they're, they're, they're smaller, they're gestural, they almost look like little um, handwriting signs that are, that are fluid and, and they're not squares on staff lines, um, but as soon as we get squares and, and diamonds on staff lines, we like to call it square notation to just make that distinction. However, because square notation evolves from neumes, we get stuff that is unrecognizable to modern notation in that sometimes two notes will be bound together in the same pen stroke. And we call those uh, words in Latin that, that get that point across. So, uh, for example, well, here we've got a huge bit of note. Um, uh, this is two, three, four, five notes all together. And this would be uh, just the end of a word. But you can see that they're all joined together in the way that their 500-year-old ancestors would have drawn this line, um, linking them all together. Uh, but most of our notes now, as you can see, are separate, and then they will only be touching if they're sung over one syllable together. And those still get those other fancy Latin names. So for example, um, a grouping that has one note and then a note just underneath it will be called a clevis uh, because it looks like a downward hill in the older notation and then we just take that and make squares out of them, chunk, chunk, and we still get that um, neum ancestry if you want. So the square quadratic notation uh, looks like this. It is on staff lines. Now if you're used to medieval chant notation and publications that have come out in the 20th century that sort of try to look like stuff like this, uh, you would look at this manuscript and wonder why it has 
five lines of the staff. Uh, now, modern uh, musicians will have no problem with this because that's how many we expect. But in the chant tradition that has grown up uh, around the tradition of, of, of the notation and the square notation, usually we're expecting four lines. So what's up with this? It has five lines. Um, the truth is that it doesn't matter and didn't matter until we started printing and, and using the printing press how many lines we actually had. The only thing that matters when you have a musical staff is where your semitones fall. How do you signal that in something like this? Well, you call out the line that you want to represent your C, and if you have a little bit of music, then you know that what naturally falls under a C is a B, and that is a semitone away. And the other line that you will call out, make everybody know what it is, is F. And this sign here is for the F line. And so, of course, what's under an F on the keyboard, if you can imagine that, is naturally the semitone E. So here I have on this page, for example, this is one chant, and they've decided that what's more convenient is to show us where C is. So when I look at this note, I know that, or this, this, um, this new grouping here, I know that I have la di, which is a semitone, la da, which is a whole tone, dum, and not la da 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 dum. I know it's la da 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 dum, just because of where the C is. Now I can keep reading and I can infer that because I've got a C up here, that means that one line down is going to be an A and, and on I go. Um, that's the way I read that. Um, so C and F are the, are the um, well, we call them keys, uh, the lines that are, that are given at the edge, the left edge of each of these staff lines. There's some Fs going down. Uh, and that, that's, how you, that's how you read where you are in musical space um, from those things. Now, a little bit of history on that. It, the reason that they chose C and F, and the reason that, that um, calling out where those semitones are is, is, is what we do, is that originally when the idea came up for, for horizontal lines to kind of uh, fix a melody in space at all, um, someone named Guido Varezzo decided that in 1025 AD he was going to have one line going across the page that was going to represent C and the other line that was going to represent F. That was it, the, the only two lines you had. And you stratified all of your notes in between those, but that way you could, and this is what he wrote in this, in this letter to the Pope, um, you, could, you could write out your melody in a way that you could then teach your boys who were learning the chant as novices in your monastery to pluck it on a monochord, which is a little string that you could shift a kind of a doorstop type thing and make the string higher or lower depending on where you shifted that. So it wasn't at first a sight reading aid. It was a, it was a way of depicting the melody to be able to be plucked and heard so that that hearing could come into the person trying to learn the, song, the, the piece that it, they could then sing it. Sight reading came later when they realized they didn't need that intermediary step of, of, of hearing it out loud. Um, but it's these two lines, the C line and this F line, um, that, that pinned the whole thing together in the original um, coming out of the staff. Now, uh, to cover all the bases, I should tell you that uh, Guido of Arezzo may have claimed to invent the staff, um, but that, that can, that's under, uh, that, that has a bit of contention to it. Um, but uh, you can read more about that if you would like. Um, anyway, there you go, the two lines. The principal writing space is 43.8 times 27 centimeters, which you can tell if you get a ruler out. But this does not include the liturgical occasion headings, which are at the very top of our book. 
And that's something that we see today, even if you open a hymnal or something in a, in a church, you'll see maybe a, maybe a subheading or a time of year that you're in, or a, you know, the, the, this is the second Sunday of Advent or something like that. And this, this is a practice that we've had for a long time. So here's the red um, markings for where you are in the, music, in the church year um, coming at the head there. It's outside of the normal writing space, but there's a line given for it there. Um, now, the other thing, paleographic-wise, is that uh, there is a rhyme or reason why some of the letters are red and some of the letters are black. Most of the letters are black, um, and then occasionally these red letters. There's um, a phrase that you may or may not have heard called a red letter day, uh, which is you know a, re a really big, important occasion. And that comes from this time where in manuscripts they would uh, write out the feast, the occasion, Easter, Christmas, whatever it was, in red letters, and they called those red letters rubrics, um, having red in the, in the word there. Uh, and so most of the red letters that you see, these red words, are telling you where you are in time. So here I happen to be in in secundo nocturno antiphonum. It's all abbreviated, but I'm expecting my, my first antiphon for my second nocturne in matins to start there, and indeed it does. Um, up here, for example, this says in Parascheve, that just means Good Friday in Latin. Uh, over here we have in Cena Domini, that means in the Supper of the Lord, so that is the Thursday, Monday Thursday in the Christian Church, where the Last Supper is celebrated and, and we get all of that. Um, so we're seeing from some of these red letters where we are uh, in the church year, and in other of these red letters, we're seeing what kind of service is happening. Here is ad completorium, so that's for Compline, that's the last monastic service of the day before bed, um, and it says here, here for Compline, ad completorium, non dicitur, which means don't say, uh, or if you do not say, ube um, domine benedicere, um, Right then, because we are in the Monday Thursday, and it's a it's a it's a different it's Holy Week, so we're doing slightly different things. And then it's going to give you a little bit more information. Um, and so uh, you don't read the the normal reading that you would have, um, but in, instead you make a confession and absolution, and then you begin with this psalm. I'm translating all this, but this is Latin. And then the black here comes. And that black is the first words of the psalm you would sing. So the red is instructional stuff, and the black is either spoken or sung. In an antiphoner, it's mostly sung, um, even if it's not given notation. And, and so that's the difference between the, um, uh, the red and the black. Sometimes they'll just be little abbreviations. So they'll call it, like, here's the beginning of a psalm, PS is the way they abbreviate psalm, and then there'll be a little opening of a psalm, which then the monks would know how to sing because they sang the psalms either all 150 every week or all 150 every day, depending on how hardcore they were. Um, so they, they would, they'd be off with five or six notes, they'd know the rest of the psalm. Then this over here, ad magnificat antiphonum. So the antiphon that goes with the magnificat, which is sung at the end of Vespers, here it is. But again, we're calling out what this is, we're labeling it, and then we begin with the actual chant. And down here, PS, Psalm, right? Um, they don't even have a Psalm here marked because instead we're going to do what? The magnificat. So that's that um, poem that gets sung at the end of Vespers as opposed to a Psalm. Um, My soul magnifies the Lord. Uh, the it's a it's a very famous text um, that goes that goes in that service. So when we think about all the all the um, offices that are in this book, um, liturgical offices, we're not thinking about the mass, but we're starting the monastic day at three o'clock in the morning, and that's matins, and that goes for about three hours. And depending on where you are in the world, um, the sun will come up slightly differently. But after about three hours, if you start at three o'clock in the morning, the sun will be heading up, and that's when you get your lauds service. And then you sing prime, which is a very small service, which is also uh, indicated a little bit in here, but not much. Um, then you get then you get 
your terce service, which comes just before your mass, which is just before noon. Then you get sects, which is at noon. And then you get none, which is at three o'clock in the afternoon. Um, and then in your later, uh, as, as the sun is going down, you get Vespers. And then once it is dark, you have Compline. So you're using the sun to regulate all the liturgical offices that you're singing all day as a monk or a nun. Um, and, and so it's changing if you're in the summertime or the winter, um, but it always goes in that order. And there's a lot of music to be done that is outside of the mass. So, all of the music that is outside of the Mass comes in these books called Antiphoners. Um, there are books for the Mass, just for the Mass, because of course that's also um, a, a very core uh, service for the church, and those are called Graduals, the ones with, with music in. Uh, they're named after a kind of chant, just like the Antiphoner is named after the Antiphon, the Gradual is named after the chant called Gradual, and that takes its name from the, from the Latin word for steps, which is what you sing when the priest is going down the steps to read the gospel, Graduale, it becomes the name for the book. There's other names for books uh, that, that are for these various places in the service. Um, if you don't have any notation, but you just have the text, for the other services, not mass, then you call it a breviary. Um, so sometimes musicologists, when they want to compare what's going on musically with the rest of the service, the lessons, this, um, all, the, all the prayers, they'll take a breviary and they'll make the two antiphon and breviary kind of come together and give you the entire service, both spoken and sung. You can say antiphoner or you can say antiphonary. It sort of depends on if you're British. Um, and in it, there are certain types of chants. The types of chants that populate the services outside of the Mass are, typically, antiphons, responsories, which are made out of the respond section and the verse section, versicles, which are very short kind of call and response things, hymns, um, and psalms, the indications of psalms. Uh, and that's, that's, that's what populate those services. And then, uh, I already mentioned that what the services are, so generally speaking, antiphoners are full of matins um, chants, because matins is the biggest service of the day. Um, I say day, but I actually mean night, of course, because these guys are singing this at four in the morning. Um, this book, in particular, because it is for Holy Week, going to Ascension, so very important time in the church year. Um, this book also includes uh, uh, a gradual chant called Hec Dies Quam Feci Dominus, which is today is the day that God has resurrected, um, but that's not in the title. And uh, it's in here because it's a very important chant. It kind of locates um, where the rest of the chants kind of circle around it in, on Easter uh, Sunday. And so it's, it's got an anomaly. So sometimes you'll have, you'll have types of chants in antiphoners that you're not expecting. Most of the time it's anti antiphons and responsories. We can see where we are in the church year by this top, these, these rubrics at the top. But we have to calculate where we probably would have started had this book been whole. Doing the fancy tricks with the choirs and the, and the um, gatherings, as I talked about in the other video. What we assume is that this book would have started in the, on the Sundays in Lent leading up to Holy Week. Um, we don't know because we don't know what were on these pages because they are gone. <clears throat> but they work out to be about... Um, well, we start on page 27. So only the, only the major chance for the Sundays before Holy Week in Lent, probably about 27 pages, we can't be totally sure. But here we are, we land when we open in the middle of Monday Thursday. So in Cena Domini, that's in the Supper of the Lord. Here we are in the middle and we start with a responsory. So we are in the middle of Matins. Um, this responsory has, that's the end of the response, and then there's a, then there's a, a verse tone here, another verse, 
another one, and then a reading. So here we're getting almost all the service. And now there's another response restarting there. So R, we see that. And now here we, we go off to the races, but we're still in the Supper of the Lord in Shenandoah <clears throat> Now, <clears throat> the last one for Monday Thursday is 37. So get there. We can tell because we've hit Compline in Compitorium. That's the last service of the day. Okay, so now we've uh, we've finished our Monday Thursday. This is mostly blank. And we start on a, new, on a new gathering, front folio, and it says Feria 6 in Parascheve. Um, Feria 6 means the sixth day of the week if you count with Sunday being the first day. Um, so what is that? That's Friday. Um, they start two, Feria 2 is Monday. So Monday, Tuesday, Monday, Tuesday Wednesday, Thursday, Friday is the sixth. And so it's Good Friday because this is in the middle of Holy Week. So we have a lot of chanting in Holy Week, including here what is called the Reproaches, uh, which is poetry written uh, from the perspective of Christ um, as, as um, asking his people what he has done wrong to deserve this kind of treatment. Uh, and it's, a, it's sung antiphonally, it's something that's only done on Good Friday, and churches even still have, have that tradition. You can hear it in various traditional church settings anyway. I am paging through here looking and I still am only seeing in Parascheve. So I keep going. Oh, until I get to right here. And this tells me Sabato Sancto in Prima Nocturnum Antiphon. So what does that mean? It means Holy Saturday in the first nocturne, the first section of Matins. And here's where I start. Um, now, I can see that there's been pages taken out. I assume that that means that the beginning of Holy Saturday for the very beginning of Matins um, looked beautiful enough for someone to want to remove it and make it into a piece of art. Um, so that's why that's why we, we guess that that uh, missing page is there. So now we are in Holy Saturday. We're in Holy Saturday for quite a while. We've got a bunch of leaves taken out of Holy Saturday here. Um, we go from page 92, we go from page 92 to page 109. So there are quite a few out here. Sorry, not page folio. I'm reading, reading the numbers. Uh, but we're still in Holy Saturday. And now we've got Compline. So we know we're getting to the end of it, ad completorium. And here we have in Die Sancto Pasche Resurrectiones ad Vesperas Antiphon. That means the first Vespers, um, the, the, the um, going into Easter Sunday as a vigil. And so this would be that. The Vespers is, is the night watch, but it goes into Easter. So we, we call it the resurrection. Um, and that gets its own page, of course, um, starting with a very nicely detailed Angelus. So now we here we are. Easter Vigil, Easter Sunday morning, heading into it. And we have the resurrection for a while. Then we get, yeah, then we get the Saturdays after and Sundays after. This is Dominica in Albis, so that just means the Sundays after Easter. And then we get some more stuff that just simply says post Pascha. So that's just after Easter, here's what you do. This is, this is the second Sunday after Easter, Dominica 2. And it's just telling us as we go the, the chance that we would want. And now, in Die Ascensione Domini, so this is the Ascension of the Lord, and it starts right here at Vesperas. So here we go. Um, again, just reading the, the rubrics. So now we're in Ascension. And very soon we will get. Oh, we're still in uh, Ascension. Here we are in Pentecost. 
Pentecost days. So we go from the middle of Holy Week to Pentecost, and of course we're skipping because we've been we've had stuff taken out. And now, with some more stuff taken out, we find ourselves in the middle of Corporis Christi, or Corpus Christi, which is a feast that was um, put into the church calendar fairly late uh, in the 13th century. So we can tell um, it, was, it was Thomas Aquinas that suggested to the Pope in 1264 uh, that the Feast of Corpus Christi, Christi be taken into the church. And so we know, I mean, it, not that it's under any um, question, uh, but we know for this manuscript being 16th century that we're expecting to find a Corpus Christi in it. Uh, and so that goes for a while, and the very end of the book just says, in the feasts after Pentecost. So that says post Pentecostione, and that's how we end. Um, getting more and more ragged as we do. Uh, with, again, some folios ripped out, so we don't know exactly how the book would have ended. Um, but it would have probably been just stuff to get you through the summer. Um, and, yeah, the, so, the, so the very, very last, the two last chants in this say, in Sundays in August. Um, what would happen at that point is that you would replace this on the side of your aisle, where half of your monks would have gathered around, with the next one. So the next one would be for Advent or whatever, and you'd have that one located there for the time to get you through that part of the church year. This, the banner of the church year uh, in terms of what's going on and the kind of the um, the emotionality and the heightened uh, intensity of, of, of the church story in Holy Week and then looking at all the stuff that comes after, like the Ascension and Pentecost and those sorts of things. Um, there's a downside for musicologists about this, and that is that in the times of year that are very important to the church, what happens is that everything gets very standardized. And so you will read the exact same chants in this book as you would read in a book 500 kilometers away in a totally different place, uh, even with a totally different kind of monk, even, uh, Benedictine, Cistercians, whatever. Um, so what happens is when you get Christmas or Easter or another, uh, Epiphany is another good example, um, those times of year are so highly standardized that when you look at a book that has those standard chants, it's impossible to tell anything in particular about the, the thing in front of you. If we'd been dealing with a different time of year, with maybe a local saint's feast involved, or maybe some chants that weren't as widespread or weren't as well known across the Christian European world in the 16th century, we'd be able to have a little bit of proof that this came from Granada, Spain, um, that maybe there would be a Spanish saint in, evoked somewhere here. But because it is Holy Week and these high holy days, um, and so late in the, in the evolution of what it means to have a manuscript as a tool for the liturgical service, uh, we end up with almost an anonymous um, feeling for a book like this, where we desperately want to find some kind of um, abnormality or, or, or local flavor which we don't have because we have Holy Week. So in one sense it's great because it's a, it's a very well-known time of the church year, and in another sense it means that it's very, um, very standard.